We looked at the educational histories of these individuals. In fact, we even got their transcripts through high school and those who attempted college, we got their college transcripts with their permission. And although I can't go over every little tidbit that we found in the histories of these individuals, you can read my book on adult ADHD for all of those findings. You can see here what we found. Education was the most impaired domain if you had ADHD. And although ADHD is going to interfere with other major life activities, this is the big one. And there's a good reason for that if you just hark back to this morning's lecture. Education, more than any other aspect of life, requires deferred gratification. And deferred gratification is what ADHD can destroy. So no surprise, it would be the area of life that most taxes delay of gratification that people with ADHD would find themselves to be the most impaired. And you can see here that it was a substantial percentage of patients had experienced these various outcomes. We found that a third of our adults with ADHD never finished high school, which is three times the U.S. average of failing to complete compulsory education. So that alone is a very telling statistic because the cost to a community if an adolescent doesn't complete high school is $375,000 to $500,000 U.S. That is what the community will lose in extra wages, extra taxes paid, extra value to the community, and increased dependence on social and other services that are provided by the community. I dare say the cost would be higher up here because you provide more services than we do. Now, when we look at the school as well as the work domain specifically, and we interviewed our adults, right, we found that <clears throat> in the work and school environments, the inattentive executive deficits were far more impairing in those domains than was the impulsive and the hyperactive deficits. We did find, however, that the emotional impulsiveness, however, was quite specific in predicting how many jobs you would be fired from in your life so that your executive deficits are determining how poorly you might be doing your job, but your emotional impulsiveness is going to predict whether you get fired. So the two symptom dimensions of ADHD have somewhat different correlates over time and predict different risks and outcomes. But mainly in school and in work, it's the executive deficits, as you see here, that are resulting in a number of complaints that our adults with ADHD voice to us about how they were suffering in the workplace, and especially the impulsive decision-making. Now, there were additional concerns as well, difficulties following directions, frequently changing jobs out of boredom, usually with no other job to go to. They just up and quit, right? I just didn't feel like working today, so I told my boss to shove it, and now I'm home, all right? <laughs> now what do I do? Okay, it's very, very common to see this inability to bridge this. Okay, I don't like this job, but maybe I should have another one lined up before I finally tell my boss what I think of him. Several studies, my own included now, but especially the New York Longitudinal Studies, are showing a massive drift to self-employment by age 30 and up. Now, this could be explained by two possible reasons, and they're not mutually exclusive. It could be an adverse outcome. Individuals with ADHD find it difficult to sustain employment when they work for other people. So what's left? They self-select into self-employment. On the other hand, it may be that self-employment is a positive niche because you can be your own boss. You can set your own schedule. You can work with, during your peak levels of attention and arousal. We know that adult ADHD delays the normal diurnal rhythm by about three to four hours. So adults with ADHD are more likely to report afternoon and night times as their most productive time. Whereas normal individuals, that is the general population, I use the word normal loosely, but the general population usually finds that the morning to early afternoon hours are their peak hours of activation. So whatever the reason may be, self-employment may allow a flexibility, a forgiveness, a latitude that is not provided when you work for other people and you have to adhere to their demands, their schedule, their hours, and so on. And also, let's not forget that in self-employment, the consequences are very near and as we explained in the last lecture, the closer the consequences are, the better you do. If you're self-employed and you don't work, you don't eat. If you work for other people, you can slack off a little bit and still get that check at the end of the week. 
So there may be something about the way consequences occur in these forms of employment that may be beneficial to the adult with ADHD. We just don't know, but certainly we are beginning to see a rise in the area of self-employed activity in about a third <clears throat> of our adults with ADHD. And of course, we've mentioned the problems with organization and self-discipline and <clears throat> pardon me, emotional impulsiveness. But now research in Europe and here has begun to put specific consequences or costs on adult ADHD in the workplace. For instance, in Mannheim, Germany at the university, a study was just done that shows that if you have adult ADHD, you are less likely to be productive in the workplace about 22 days a year more than other people. You can put a cost on that. That actually produces a, a detrimental effect on the workplace and your employer. Our adults with ADHD were interviewed about problems they might be having in the workplace, and you can see what we found here. Adults with ADHD complain much more across most of these areas of workplace difficulties than did adults in either of our control groups. Uh, particularly, <clears throat> look at the one about quitting a job out of boredom. I just don't care for this job anymore. It's not very interesting. I'm out the door. You know, two to two and a half times more likelihood of changing jobs and changing more jobs. That was a percentage, not a frequency measure. The frequency measure is even greater. <clears throat> and so if we start to put costs on this, you will see here that there's at least a four to five percent reduction or more in overall productivity, two times the rate of sick leave, two times the rate of accidental injuries in the workplace. And the cost to the employer per year is going to be about four to five thousand US dollars of decreased productivity in the workplace. You add that up, that gets to be a lot of money. That is billions of dollars. So no surprise, we are now seeing in the US that large employers are beginning to take adult ADHD more seriously in trying to identify it. And some of them are trying to get help for these employees. Others are simply trying to identify what the risks are. You may not be aware of it, but the US Army screened everybody who enlisted for the first six months of 2008 for adult ADHD. The reason? because they believe that it has a negative effect on technical school training. And they need to know that. And they need to know whether shifting these people into different occupational areas, known as MOs, in the military would be better and less costly. Technical training is a very, very expensive part of military enlistment for the Army. And they are now looking at the impact of adult ADHD on this aspect of training. This is all simply to indicate that big employers are beginning to see the writing on the wall, and start to take adult ADHD more seriously. <clears throat> so the two areas that we found to be most impaired in our adults were school, followed by work 